Well, not. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order of the audit committee, Friday, November 1st, 2024, a regular meeting. I think it's the first regular meeting we've had in five or six months, so good to be back on our schedule. Uh, I'd like that to ask the interpreter to explain how to use our interpretation services. Please go ahead. Announcement from interpreter. To use the interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are, click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as your language. If you are joining through the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish slow in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you are in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lot. Aviso por parte del intérprete. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles, haga clic en el icono de interpretación, globo terráqueo, y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio, Silenciar Audio Original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de la reunión, por favor de pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Thank you. Thank you. Would you now please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, liberty and justice for all. We're going to move into the agenda just for public speaker information. Um, all of the items will have two minutes today to speak outside of item number two and consent, which we will only have one minute for public speaking on those two items. So with that, um, Francesca, do we have any uh, public speakers on non-agenda public comments? Thank you, Chair. I have one public speaker virtual. Call in user one, please go ahead. Hey, it's call in user one, otherwise known as truth. You know, I was actually call in user three a couple of days ago in the city of San Diego. What do you know? Um, so are you guys having a meeting the day after Halloween? Did none of you stay out late trick or treating or at spooky parties? Me neither. Better to avoid children on artificial sugar highs or adults stumbling around drunk in costumes with cartoon characters. So audit team, at the last VOD meeting, I actually wanted to ask if the quotes of people like Hassan were recordings or from memory or what, but it sounds like you didn't actually get any quotes from anybody important. So definitely get interviews of past board members and executives and get it recorded and obviously get permission for those recordings, or at least take notes something, because I think that is definitely a necessity. And there's probably a lot of other ideas I had, but I didn't know I was going to comment. So that's all I got on that. So let's talk about something else relevant right in the middle of it. Elections. Guess what? No person can directly vote for the president. You can write in there Mickey Mouse and the same person's going to be selected president by the electors, not you. Now, I understand that may be shocking, but from Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution of the United States of America, quote, each state shall appoint electors. The electors shall vote for two persons, and they shall make a list of all the persons voted for. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be the president. If no person have a majority, then from the five highest on the list, the House shall choose the president, end quote. See, nobody's ever told the American people that lawful reality. We never even hear mention of the other four people on the list the electors are supposed to make. However, uh, local elections are important, so do vote local. But you need to know the real law so you're not going to be fooled by anything. Oh, uh, and I think that's all of the time I have to speak about random stuff. So have a good meeting, everybody. Happy Halloween after the fact. Thank you. That concludes the non-agenda public comments. Great. Thank you. Um, with that, do we have any non-agenda uh, 
Committee member comments. Anybody like to make a comment? Non agenda. Yeah. Okay, Agnes. Yeah. So I just want to follow up, you know, about the policy 39. I know we talked about that and we can have a recommendation going to the board. And I don't remember what happened to it. Yeah, I can answer that, which was we presented to the board. Um, along with many other board policy updates in one of the May board meetings, can't remember which one. And there were some comments made by the second vice chair, which caused it to be pulled at that time. And it's along with two other of the board policy recommended changes. And so there's three of them out there waiting and it's just waiting to be slotted on a board agenda. And it will be coming back. Uh, I can't say when, um, but it's it's been along with the other two other policies that were discussed at that time. They've been all sitting there waiting for a spot on a board agenda. Just want to make sure we don't miss the window because I think it has been you know on the agenda or on the table for a long time. And I, I think our understanding or the way explained to us is that the board only look at policy changes certain months like October or so. So I don't want to miss that window and have to wait for another year. Yeah, rest assured I'm on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Mara can probably even confirm, you know, there was another policy item that came to the executive committee at the last time, which is also now, so there's now four at least waiting for the board, and I don't know when they'll be addressed unless Mara, you know. In, in addition to the traditional process, we're going to be setting up probably early next year. That doesn't mean that this is, may not go through the traditional process, but we have, um, we, we're planning to have a facilitated meeting with the board um, as we prepare and go over holistically of a lot of their policies or the majority of them and just see how the board wants to continue or reinvent some of the policies of the agency. So I think there's going to be a couple of bites to the apple. Um, so I'm I I am not tracking uh, policy 39. So I'll check on that also. I know Amberlynn had mentioned something to me about it, um, but but I do want to also let you know that there's going to be hopefully some sort of a get together with the board and have some discussions overall on the policies and delegations. Yes, yeah. And thanks for bringing that up because it has been a while. Um, uh, then we'll go ahead and move on to item number two, which is the Office of the Independent Performance Auditor Activities. Courtney. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. I'm Courtney Ruby. I'm the Independent Performance Auditor. And there has been a lot going on, which is going to be covered today in my presentation. So today, as far as my report, I'm just going to let you know that this afternoon, we will be releasing SANDAG's first ethical climate survey. So this is a first step towards building and maintaining an ethical organization or to assess the current environment and identify any changes that are needed. The questions in this survey posed evaluate accountability, responsiveness, integrity, trust, fairness, communication, and leadership present at SANDAC. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. I'm just curious, since we missed it last time as well, if you had any comments on uh, the training or any updates on what happened since uh, that's what caused us to push the meet last meeting that we had. Yes, we were involved in um, training for government auditing standards, and I'll touch on that in my presentation as well. Um, so the entire team was uh, involved in a audit, generally accepted government auditing principles boot camp the week that we normally would have held our audit committee meeting. In October, yes, thank you. Uh, Francesca, do we have any public comments on item number two? Thank you, Chair, there are no public comments. Oh, we switched to, I'm sorry, it's Tessa over there. <laughs> sorry, Tessa. <laughs> I'm used to being Francesca. Uh, okay, with that, we'll go ahead and move over to item number three, which is consent. Um, Tessa, do we have any public comments on consent? There are no public comments on consent. Okay. Do we have any member comments on consent? Um, Ms. Wong Nickerson. Yes. Um, I 
want to make a comment that um, I missed a July meeting. I was on vacation. Uh, so I was trying to go into the minute and see, you know, what was being discussed. And, and actually, really, there's no detail at all. Uh, same as the October, you know, minutes that I was there. And we had a lot of, I thought, really great uh, comments and, you know, discussions. And again, it was not in the minutes. And I know that in the last several months, the minutes have been very brief compared to, say, a year ago, you know, uh, I think if you went back, the minutes were much more informative, really captured uh, not just the action item, uh, not just the board, mem uh, the committee members' recommendations, but there are a lot of a you know interesting discussion that was captured, and I find it very useful. And I think in the spirit of transparency and good communication, I would like to see us going back to capture more detail in the minutes rather than just say, oh, we talk about this item and we just voted yes or no. Okay, thanks. Um, I can let staff jump in. I, I'll provide a little bit of context here. Um, and I appreciate the comments and there have been public comments uh, along a similar vein. Uh, I can just stipulate that what's going on was discussed and sort of decided, I believe it at a board level, maybe, or maybe it's a staff level. And the intent being that um, particularly now that we've entered a realm at the board where there's a lot more public comment that's going on, the, the minutes reference the link to the video of the meeting. So if you go to the minutes, you can click on the link to the video meeting and see what people said, um, because there was be getting more and more challenge of um, accurately capturing what folks said in the minutes and figure it was better to just let people go see what was said in the video as opposed to trying to accurately capture in the minutes and spend uh, a lot of time fixing the minutes um, as people make comments. But that was the genesis of why that, that was actually a conscious change, which was, if people want to see or hear what was going on, they should just watch the video. Um, and there is an advantage, which now, since you know the in modern technology, you know you can speed the video up to 1.25, 1.5, 1.75, even 2.0 if you can hear some people talking that fast. And um, so it was a conscious decision. And I can see the pros and cons either way, but I'm just letting you know it wasn't done without uh, without uh, without thought behind it. I don't know, Mario, if you wanted to add anything else. Okay, thanks. I, I do think there's a good middle ground, yeah. right? Because the, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. video, for example, yeah. you know, the board meeting last one was four hours. There's no, right. It's very hard for most people to watch it. And even our auto committee meeting was yeah. two hours long. Um, you know, I, if you look back a year ago, I don't think we had a lot, of, at least the auto committee minutes, I don't think we had a lot of controversies there. And, and sometimes just capture, you know, very high level, you know, we talk about this and you know, yeah. member expressed concern. So it's, it's heard, and I'm sure we talked about it. Actually, the thing that I would find most useful is that the minutes could capture the time marker on the video of when people are speaking. I, think you I was going to say yeah. that that um, maybe what we can do is put in the time marker in a paragraph description, right? Of, in, Or if it's a subject, right? If you, we go by item number and we say this item was discussed at um, uh, um, our our Fifteen, and then just moving there. But I am putting maybe a one paragraph description of what the discussion or item that it was. Maybe that would be the middle ground. Um, but let us look into it. Let us see if we can put something in there, and then give us feedback uh, of, of how good or bad it is. Yeah, I, I think it would be good that you know at least more subtitle if you don't want to capture the discussion itself because as I said there, there were some really good discussions and ideas in the meeting and I would hate to not have it you know being very clearly demonstrated in a minute so that people have to go watch the whole meeting itself so yeah right so being yeah. captured thanks for that um sorry go ahead Courtney my understanding too is that there's a new software being implemented and okay. it will time stamp as well. So when you click on it, so it sounds like there's some great yeah, that'd be, developments that, that would be great. underway. That would be awesome. Thanks. Okay, with that, um, no other comments. I'd entertain, entertain a motion to approve uh, the minutes for uh, July 11th and October 11th. So moved. Moved by Drucker. A second. I second. Uh, second by Pigney Forest. So go ahead, please vote.
And that motion passes unanimously with uh, Member Wong Nish Nickerson abstaining. We now move on to the regular agenda uh, into the report section, item number four. Uh, we did discuss the investigation last time, um, but due to the fact that the investigation report was released so quickly, uh, the management re response hadn't been uh, released at that point in time, although Mario was here and made a few comments, but I just wanted to make sure that since the management actually did put out a response that the audit committee had a chance to look at it and provide any input or comments or feedback um, to the response that was presented. And um, I will note that this, both of these items were discussed at the last board meeting. There was a pretty robust discussion. Um, I didn't personally take any action items away for this committee. I don't know, Courtney, if you heard anything that you think, think we needed to act on. I did not hear okay, anything that outside required of, further action. Great, thanks. That We do have our recommendations. They will continue to be followed up on. With that, I'll hand it over to Mario. Thanks. Thank you. I, I think it's, you know, it's going to be pretty much what I mentioned to the board, right? Um, one of the recommendations is make the structural changes. They're happening as we're speaking. Um, we have um, began our focus with the project delivery teams, um, and we have uh, created a structure where we're going to have a group that's overseeing general projects and their policies and the construction. We have another team that's gonna focus on project controls and project management and developing those controls and procedures. And then we have Omega Projects and IT, uh, a management team that has been created. And we have put in a specific group that deals with ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems um, uh, 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 projects. That's where we're going from a structural perspective. We should be going to the board sometime in December, I hope it's no later than January, with the um, positions uh, classifications to clearly define those positions so we could put the right people in places. Uh, we are also in the process of uh, bringing in what I call a chief informational officer. Um, clearly, everything was bundled in one thing. And when I gave my update to the board is we plan, we design and build the system for a facility, and then we hand that up to somebody to, to, um, to operate it. And everybody should have an input on that. That's called the systems requirements process. And uh, in federal highways is the B diagram um, for, for this type of systems. So we have put in that in place that's moving forward. Um, and, and, and I'm not just, the issue is not just the 125 back office. It's an entire structural challenge with our delivery in this agency. So we're also going to be having, we have another group that's already looking into all the recommendations that you're tracking and that, uh, and that uh, Courtney and others or our external auditors have developed. Um, and we're going to be bundling them, seeing the training, the actions that need to require. So we have a group that's master evaluating that. So seeing how they interconnect with all the other actions that we are. So we, we, we are not just working as a silo. We're connecting the dots. So one thing that you probably will see also in the near future is a project management academy. Our project managers are project institute certified. But um, sometimes you have to have that training on the processes, but also on the logic, right? Sometimes we need that mentor to tell us, um, hey, um, you don't go to step three before you go to step two, right? So we're going to have to do that and bring it back to the processes and needs of this agency from even funding perspectives. Uh, regarding the sole source uh, recommendation, we're already tracking. Um, I personally am tracking every single sole source of this agency and 
look, we, we can't stop soul sourcing overnight and we're never going to stop it because sometimes it's needed. Um, but we're starting to evaluate each one of them. The ones that are coming to me, I, I'll give you some examples. There was a one occasion, one director came in and said, I want a soul source. And this was the for five years and it was going to be already 14 or 15 years that they have been doing that soul source. So that um, I can tell you that one got sent back and said no. Um, in another occasion, there was a sole source that came in and said, "We yes, I understand I have to do a new procurement, but it's going to take me six to six to one year, uh, six months or a year to put out, and I have ongoing work. Well, we can't stop the work of the agency in that particular case. So instead of giving that person a five-year sole source, we made it a 12-month sole so source with the condition that it's not going to be extended and they have to start working on a separate procurement. So, you know, I have to say that some of my directors and Amberlin have been very supportive and, and critical in the aspect that they are helping me create those guardrails. Um, we are bringing in I don't know if um, a person, I won't say yet the name, but that they're going to be evaluating all our policies and procedures, um, internal ones, and mapping up also where we, what are the different steps in different projects or processes and aligning the policies to those steps that need to be mapped. Um, the 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 I think the conversation we will need to have that still it's it's clear the recommendation on sole sourcing of maybe not doing it in ITS but when it's needed doing it so creating that those steps to evaluate when they're needed I think it's something I was going to sit down with Courtney once we start evaluating the processes overall you know at the end of the day. The, the the recommendations are spot on. Um, if I have something that I'm, I won't say I'm happy about it, but that gives me some relief is that some of those recommendations are already being implemented. That's my response and I, I, I welcome any questions. So we don't have a project management team now, right? And you're just adding that in the because you had mentioned a project management academy now. So do we have a project management team? No, we have an engineering and design group. We did not have a program project management group separate that would act as a balance to the designers. So a mentor I had here at Sandak many years ago told me, don't fall in love with your project. And when you fall in love with your project, you're going to do all what you can to get that project done. But sometimes you need to just have those checks and balances to bring you back to reality to see that maybe the change order is too high. Maybe you shouldn't be requesting a for a grant that you won't be able to deliver. Or maybe you're building a project in one location when there's another project coming in that may actually tear out that element. Um, zooming out and looking at those big pictures, sometimes program project management helps out in having the checks and balances. I think that that's where we were a little bit weak. Yeah, um, I think that's a good idea to have a project management team on board. So thank you. Okay, wait, sorry, one thing. Before we get to too much discussion, I wanted to check if there are public speakers here. Um, Tessa, are there public speakers? Thank you, Chair. There are no public speakers. Okay, great. So go ahead, um, Ms. wong Nickerson, with your question. Yeah, I do have a follow-up and then um, a comment. Um, I thought that in the previous uh, OIPA management uh, audit report, it mentioned that actually Sandak used outside project managers a lot. Did I re misremember that? Which is kind of also created a very strange situation. Uh, rather than in-house project managers? Uh, well, somebody has to do the checks and balances in-house, right? If, yeah. if, and um, 
yet the agency tends to outsource more the design and a lot of the project management support. Um, I would say that we have to clearly define the roles and responsibilities for QA, QC, uh, quality assurance, quality control for both our design managers and our project managers. And that's for capital projects, but the same applies to planning efforts, or even in this case that we're discussing a back office system, right? And, and having those checks and balances. So yes, we, we do hire support groups. Um, I think one thing of the audit here was that the, let's say, quad, quasi assistant project manager recommended not to proceed with a sole source. It was recommending to develop a, 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 a systems requirement before you go and move with it. Um, and th so it was there, the system was working on the private side, but on the internal sites, I think we then do the checks and balances. And needing, having some clear steps there are under policy that um, creates that the CEO or any director will be responsible for deviating from some processes like a systems requirement process. Um, you know, if you're going to own it, you should own it, right? And um, right now, there's there doesn't seem to be a process where the decision can be made, but there's no clear owner that's signing up saying, I'm taking the risk or I'm owning the risk. Right. And then a general comment, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you are actually stepping back, looking at more the infrastructure foundational change rather than just fixing the specific problem because it's so important. And also sounds like you have a lot of actually operational experience. You know what should have happened or what should happen. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, give me some comfort. We do appreciate it. We will, and this will probably not go well in some venues, we will have to pause some projects that probably don't make sense. Um, that doesn't mean any major infrastructure project, so I don't want to spook anybody. But look, if, if, if we know that in this street, there's going to be a major, major, major development that is going to redo that entire street or highway, why are we planning a project that we know that it's going to be teared off or is not going to align? Or why are we doing it? Maybe that that development will be doing that mitigation. Why is the agency doing it on behalf of somebody else? That's just one example. So we're going to have to step back and see, prioritize what is really needed from a public perspective and from a commitment perspective. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? David? Just again, Mario, um, appreciate the response and uh, look forward to the project management office. I mean, that's a long time and coming. We were promised that about a year ago or so, at least. So I, I want to introduce two people, uh, Clint and Alex. Um, Clint is the new director of program project management. He was the, the focal point in Caltrans. Actually, he was in process of being offered to be the head of program project management statewide for the state. And, and we were in a race to see if he would prefer coming to Sandak. So I guess he likes big challenges. And Alex Estrella is going to be our, our future uh, manager. He's already doing it, but that reclassification that we need to go through, because right now, to be honest, I think I'm working Alex out of class. Um, he is in charge now of ITS. He's the one who has been doing the, since June or July, the back office system, systems requirements for the tolling system. 
and he will be developing also the technical needs for managed lanes. He will also be developing and is developing the technical needs for the Otay Mesa East tolling system that um, will not be sole source. It will be put out to bid. It won't be connected to the system. And if it's connected to this system, it's because somebody has proved to us through a process that it adds value. But this is two part two members of the management team that it's now directly related to this response. Uh, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Clint Peace, uh, the Director of Program Project Management, SANDAG. Uh, as Mario mentioned, it came from Caltrans District 11. About um, I was the Assistant Project Manager for a while in the I-5 North Coast Corridor and leading, um, helping with the CMGC efforts in the San Leo Bridge, and then the last about 10 years in the Project Management Division. And so when Mario asked me to come over to take on this challenge, it was, uh, it was very exciting. I look forward to, to working with you all. Clint has also been working a lot in data governance at the state. So I think that's going to be something very important of how we're going to interconnect the different systems. Alex? Good morning, Alex. Sorry, technology planning manager. I've been with Sandag, Mike, I don't want to say when, but we were only at, I think, three floors. Um, but the, the experience that I've gained has been in the realm of operations, uh, transportation operations. Um, and also, and then uh, ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems, since then. I worked in federal and state projects. Um, one of the comments to bring attention to the responses is that we do follow the system engineering process. And, and that is really our, our technically our kind of a, a blue book to follow when we implement technology projects, because while, you know, I would say the Certification is important at staff level, but going through the experience to actually applying the certification methods and processes in place to deliver it's critically important. So I'm excited about this opportunity because uh, I, I do value um, um, the the offer that, that, that we could provide to make sure that the agency actually follows a, a strict process through the leadership of Mario because process is important, but also applying procedures and having that foundational structure behind is completely important. Thank you. Well, thanks to both of you for joining the team. Looking forward to uh, the work output that comes from the, the group. I think it'll be very helpful and very effective. Not sure, I, I think we're all aware of the challenges that Sandeg is facing and the opportunities ahead, but I'm not really sure I would say the state's in any better shape. So <laughs> what I do think, what I, what I take away from the fact that you managed to attract uh, these guys here, or Clint here, is that they, that they believe in you and that you have the agency has the back of this office and it will be an effective place to be. So that's a good sign, um, I think. Any other comments or questions, Ed? Just a real quick one. Uh, at the last board meeting, Mara, we discussed um, the potential to take the tolling away from the 125 and you were talking about falling in love with projects. And so now we have a sole source because this kind of dovetails into the entirety of the conversation and without a project manager. Um, we agreed a sole source contract for tolling software for the 15125, the revenue of which would pay for the, the contract for that software. And at the same time, we're considering removing tolling from the 125. So it shifts the burden to the 15 or another revenue source. So I don't know in that contract that we have with Deloitte and A to B, if there's any step where we could downsize it or if that's even a consideration or a necessity. I just want to be careful. This isn't on the agenda, so we just yeah. need to be careful well, about how far we go on yeah. that. But it's a good point of input. I think one one thing that I can tell you, and Alex is negotiating this. Um, we one we got clear direction for the board for the short and mid and long term vision of this agency's working with uh, tolling systems, and let it be one twenty five, fifteen future managed lanes and the rest of the highways, as well as all time Mesa East. Following that board guidance, um, you know, I think Alice, Alex has been brief on that guidance and he's working on implementing what the board gave us as guidance and reduce the exposure for the agency. I think 
big picture, that's what I can tell. Uh, Amberlin, I can see Amberlin's looking at me like, don't say more. <laughs> I, I think Amberlin's <laughs> ready to hit me too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good Thank comment. You, I think there's lots of discussion to be had there, but on an agenda-sized item relative to it. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, that's a good update, and thanks for coming in and sharing that with us, Mario. And good to meet these two new team members. With that, we'll move on to item number five, which is uh, we're about to kick off our annual comprehensive financial review and um, we have Kimberly Trammell and Jennifer Farr that are involved in this process to give us an update. Thanks. Good morning, Kimberly Trammell, the Director of Finance and Accounting, and I am here to introduce Jennifer Farr with Davis Farr, who will be giving you an overview of the audit planning for the June 30, 2024 fiscal year. Um, so it's underway and Jennifer will give you a little bit more information about the timeline and the process. Good morning, committee members. I have a short PowerPoint presentation to facilitate communicating to you the scope and the timing of the audit and our audit risk assessment for this year. We are currently uh, just getting started on the planning of the audit and have not started the final audit uh, field work yet. So I'll go over again the scope timing and also at the end, Go tell you about some new accounting standards just so you're aware of what's coming down uh, in the future. Starting off just with the audit engagement team members, I always feel like it's good just to kind of see the faces if you see them uh, walking around the building or, or working with them. Uh, your engagement includes um, a significant number of uh, talented uh, personnel. The top line is kind of the, the main team that you're working with, and then the bottom line is our quality control partners and our IT partners that are here to make sure we're following professional standards and giving a kind of a second look on everything that we that the top line audit team performs for you. As a reminder, the scope of the engagement includes both financial statement audits and compliance audits for each of the different component units of SANDAG, including the Transportation Commission, Argus, Source Point, uh, South Bay Expressway has its own standalone financial statement audit. And then we perform a federal single audit on your federal grant awards every year. And then kind of separately, we have audits of TDA recipients and then some agreed upon procedures that are part of this engagement. At the beginning of the audit, we provide an audit engagement letter that defines the auditor's responsibilities and management's responsibilities. And this is a good time of year just to remember who's responsible for which parts of the audit and the financial statements. The auditors are required to identify risk and perform audit procedures to address those risk areas. We obtain an understanding of internal controls solely for purposes of designing those tests of your financial statement numbers. And we perform tests of compliance with laws and regulations in accordance with government auditing standards. This is my caveat to you because of the inherent limitations on the way an audit's performed with sampling, there is an unavoidable risk that there could be an error in your financial statements that the audit process, even though well-designed, will not detect. So don't have too much over-reliance on, um, on the audit. Um, we will do everything we can to find material misstatements, but even in a properly performed audit, it's possible that errors may exist. And then on your side, management's responsibilities is for the presentation of the financial statements, for designing those internal controls and following the laws and ensuring a high level of compliance. You're also required to give us unrestricted access to information that we ask for and to ensure that the information provided to us is accurate and complete. Moving on to the timing of the audit, we performed some preliminary audit procedures in the July timeframe. This is largely related to evaluating internal controls and performing test of controls we also do fraud questionnaires and other planning procedures to get ready for the upcoming audit. 
And we are scheduled to come back and begin the final audit on December 3rd. This is later than normal, and that's primarily due to the implementation of the new ERP system and the additional time that staff needs to prepare for the audit. I think we all desire that at the beginning of the audit, everyone feels comfortable that the numbers are accurate, and that should minimize the number of auditor detected adjustments that are occurring during the audit process. When we do come back, our main focus is to look at those numbers and dive down and see if there are any errors that are material misstatements. We're also concurrently working on the TDA and SDA audits, and those are going well, um, better than last year. We're not having any difficulty working with the re recipient agencies. And then at the very end, we will do the single audit. Typically, we'll do this after the financial statement is done. And the final deadline on the single audit is March 31st to have that filed. And I don't have any reason to believe that we will um, have difficulty meeting that deadline. So moving on to identification of audit risk, I'm sure we've talked about this in the past that our process for evaluating audit risk involves looking at both external and internal factors. We read the local news, we uh, meet with management staff, we have fraud questionnaires, we meet with you uh, today, we review the independent auditors, performance auditors reports, and we use all that information to determine where we believe the financial statements are potentially subject to material misstatement. And then we design additional procedures above and beyond our normal audit procedures to address those risks to a relatively low level where we can feel certain that there are no material misstatements. So for the risk areas that are identified uh, for this year's audit, fiscal year 23-24, obviously the implementation of the new ERP system creates some unusual risks that, and additional testing on our end. Uh, there's risk about errors with conversion of data, there's new processes involved and also changes in the IT environment. So there'll be a substantial effort on our ends to make sure um, that change didn't result in any, any errors in the accounting records. We've discussed the toll revenues and issues with back office systems in the past. That continues to be a high risk audit area uh, for the auditors. This year or last year, there was an issuance of the 2023 Series A sales tax revenue bonds. There, it was a complex debt issuance with a complex refunding, and it includes um, the termination of interest rate swaps. Probably the most complex uh, transaction from a debt standpoint that I've seen in you know five six years, I would say. And we've spent substantial time reviewing that to make sure everything's recorded properly uh, in the accounting records. We also identify the federal single audit compliance as a high risk area and we'll follow the OMB guidelines on what to test, how many programs to test and those audit procedures. And then I also wanted to share our unpredictability test with you this year. Every year we're required to have a different test. That's something we didn't do in the past. And this year we've decided to do more of a deep dive on governmental receivables. I'll use Caltrans as an example. You have a receivable from them. So doing additional testing to ensure the proper cutoffs for revenue and receivable recognition. And we're gonna take it a step further and send confirmations to those third party government agencies and have them confirm that their records essentially agree to your records when it comes to some of those larger receivable balances. And then I did wanna point out for our risk assessment, it is an ongoing process. This is what we have today. If something uh, more information becomes available to us tomorrow, we will react to that information and modify our audit procedures as needed um, all the way up until the day we issue the audit report. So lastly, I just wanted to give you a quick update on the upcoming accounting standards that are going to potentially affect SANDAG's financial statements. 
for this year, there's just a small standard that clarifies how to account for changes and error corrections that I don't anticipate will have uh, much of an impact on your financials. Um, next year, a little more significant, a change in the how compensated absences, so vacation, sick time, is calculated and reported in your financial statements. For most agencies, this is resulting in increasing the liability balance, and that would be reported as a, a prior period adjustment for the implementation of that standard. GASB 102 increases certain risk disclosures on concentrations and constraints, and constraints are defined as something that's limiting how you can spend money. So you can imagine there, there could be some additional disclosures for SANDAG when we implement that one. And then a year down the line will be two additional standards uh, to implement. The financial reporting model is actually a fairly significant one. It's been in the works for a long time. It will substantially change a lot of how your financial statements look. It'll include significant changes to the management's discussion and analysis, and also how the enterprise funds or proprietary funds are reported in your financial statements, including some new terminology and some clarification of what is considered operating revenue, non-operating revenue. Um, so that'll be something that your staff will need to spend substantial time getting comfortable with those changes to make sure that the, that it's implemented correctly. And then 104 is just some uh, minor changes in how you disclose capital assets in the financial statements. So with that, that's all the prepared comments that I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have for us. Great, thank you. I think first, again, I'll just check for public speakers. Do we have any public speakers on this item, Tessa? There are no public comments on this item. Great, thanks. And uh, I'll start just by thanking you for the presentation today and for coming out. And I know the, that uh, last year was a pretty tricky and challenging year, and I appreciate all the work that your firm did in helping working through that. And um, and glad that we're having you back again. But I'll see if any of the members have any comments or questions. Yeah, thank you for making the presentation. Um, I have a quick question. So last year, as Dave mentioned, it was a challenging one, and um, you were not able to give a you know normal, clean opinion, right? Uh, that you were not able to opine on the I think total revenue number. Um, do you? expect maybe the same situation this year or has the SENDAC done enough work to, you know, um, mitigate that issue? Thank you. That's an excellent question. One that's probably on everyone's mind. So thank you for articulating it. Um, I, at this point, it is, it's too early to be able to tell you what our ultimate conclusions are going to be. Um, I can tell you that, um, Based on my understanding, there's there's still ongoing uh, work being done to reconcile some of the issues that existed last year. So if those issues still exist, you can expect that we will probably have the same result in our audit opinion. But again, it's it's a little premature for me to draw a conclusion at this point. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I can add to that. Um, I think, you know, Jennifer is very, very, very uh, politically correct in, in her response, which is her job. Um, we're going through a new back office system. That's not going to be implemented overnight. Um, so every journey starts with a first step. And I think this process of reconciling may be a journey that it won't be completed in one year. And I hope I'm very wrong on that, but just seeing the picture in front of us, there are several elements that will be, st there are starting to be worked on and are getting fixed. But I think we will also have to have more items that we, hopefully we have checked enough, but it may take us uh, one or two cycles to get out of that uh, uh, decision. Thanks for the update. So, so it sounds like 23, 24, that's what you'll be auditing. It's already history and it's done. So that 
probably we'll still have the same problem, but maybe even the following year still unclear. Okay, thanks. Thanks for setting the right expectation, actually. Yeah, and we actually, have to manage expectations, right? <laughs> and actually, just so, I mean, this this question will be both for management and um, Jennifer, which is, I mean, in the context of what caused us to get to a qualified opinion, are, is everyone clear on what's causing that? And, and Jennifer's been able to communicate adequately and what the reason is behind it. And we know, or we believe we know the steps we need to take to actually address that, or is there work to be even done in this space? I, I mean, we've very much looked at um, what caused it and um, been working with the system we currently have to make improvements and um, resolve those issues. Um, there, I think kind of what Mario was indicating is there's certain limitations in what we have. And so we may not be able to overcome some of those limitations until we have a new back office system, which is why it may take a couple cycles. Um, but yes, I, I think we have a good idea of what we're, what needs to be improved and we've been moving in that direction. Okay, helpful. Um, but again, so just from the perspective of, because it, it provides some concern to me that, you know, originally I believe our plan was to try to move to a new system at the start of the year my belief is based upon what I heard that's going to get delayed. Um, and there's even uh, guidance that's been provided as to what our near short, midterm, long-term strategies are in this space that is not currently public because it was discussed in closed session. And so from my perspective, it's really unclear that we have a plan to get this addressed in a realistically meaningful time frame, And that's what I'm trying to understand. It's like, uh, are we going to, uh, we know we had a qualified opinion. We know the previous year um, is already closed out and it's using the same system, uh, you know, based upon what I see, you know, it, it's entirely possible that this year will be fully on our current system as well. And that could even slip into next year as well. So are we talking about, we don't have any idea if we can do better than four years in a row of a qualified opinion. And which I'd like to see a plan that could try to address that sooner than that. So I will, let me talk about a couple of things that are going on that okay. are helping to address this, um, not necessarily related to the back office system, but one of the things the board approved last month was um, the write-off of the, the accounts receivable. And so we're getting rid of some really, really old accounts receivable items that are part of the problem with our reconciliation. So that's one step in the right direction. And then all of, you know, the current system has been looked at very closely. And so um, all of the, the good thing is this has brought to light things that we need to look at and work on. And so we've been working on the current system to put some fixes in place that'll improve the reconciliation. So there are uh, items in that we are currently working on that are moving forward that will assist with this. Will it be enough is something that the auditors have to look at and issue their opinion. And how much of that is going to be exposed in the current audit, or are we talking about next year's audit? Um, it'll be at both years. I think you'll okay. see some of it in the so year. So you'll be able to get some feedback this year as to whether or not it's going to be likely to be adequate. Yes. Okay, thanks. And, and look, let's put it on the table. Um, you know, we talked about lack of systems requirements on the back office. There was a lack of systems requirements in the ERP. And there was no discussion when they were planning on how the existing or the future back office systems was going to talk to the accounting system. We have been going and looking. There are modulars that will help with that. And, um, and the team can stop me at any time if I'm saying something out of line because I'm, I look at it from 100,000 feet. Um, we have been looking at best practices of TCA, OCTA, and other agencies, how they're doing those interfaces between their accounting systems and their back offices. Um, some OCTA is basically doing it all manual. Um, we will probably be having a combination of some looking into some patches of the existing or future systems to help with that. 
and we will also be taking the procedures that OCTA and TCA, uh, those are in Orange County, successful ventures that are happening with other public agencies and tolling on how their, their accounting departments are dealing with the data and reconciliation about that. So it's going to be a mixture of systems and labor work from our accounting department and trying to get to that right point. Uh, but that is the reality, right? That we, we as an agency didn't look forward that much with the systems requirement, um, not just with the back office, but also with an accounting system. Yeah, thanks for that, Mario. I also did want to address one more, yeah, one more comment, which is, um, I know Mario didn't intend anything by this, but uh, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit, maybe disagree that um, I don't think I find Jennifer's comments politically correct. I would say they're actually direct and they're direct and transparent. She's speaking to what she knows at this point in time. She may have a personal opinion about something else, but her job is to talk about what she knows. And and so she was very direct and transparent. So you don't have to add to that. I, and but. that was my yeah. my point of that comment. Yes, right. no, I understand. I just, misunderstood. That could be I apologize. Yeah, that could be misinterpreted. So I just want to be very clear about that. Okay. Other, uh, Agnes, you want to say something? So Kimberly, I want to ask, you know, the ERP is a new this is the uh, new system, right, to send that. And I think in our last meeting, it was brought to our attention that there's some issue with the procurement side that it doesn't work with the financial reporting. And are there other areas under the ERP that uh, you see that there are issues or concerns that the audit committee should be aware of? That's a great question. Um, in a new ERP system is a big change for any organization. And, um, you know, you you buy the system and you think it's going to solve all your problems when in reality it just it, it solves some problems, it, but it changes how you do everything. It changes every process. And so you have to adapt to that. Um, with contracts, my opinion, and, and keep in mind I'm not in contracts, um, we, we want to use it as a means of tracking all the paper trail and tracking all the approval process and everything. And the, and the ERP system wasn't designed to do that. It was actually designed to do the financial side of the contracts, the encumbrances of these contracts and the, the tracking of how many contracts you have open, that kind of thing. So it is doing the financial piece. It's not doing the other pieces that we need to have an efficient contracts office. Um, so I don't foresee that being an issue with our financial reporting as long as we make sure that the correct information is getting into the ERP system. Um, the you're always you, you continue to have some other systems and you're always dependent on those integrations or um, getting the information from one system to the other and so that'll that's uh, similar to what we're seeing with the back office is we need to be able to say here's all the detailed information that's in the back office system and here's all the summary journal entry information that's going into our ERP system so as long as that flow of information is accurate. We shouldn't have any problems. We're still working through how some of that is going to work. And that was the um, a, a, the root, I would say, of some of the problems that we're having um, last year. And so um, we just need to work through all of these things and make sure that they're doing what they should do correctly. I don't foresee other areas um, of the ERP system that would cause any problems with financial reporting. Uh, I go back to, it's a big learning curve. Everybody in the agency has had to learn, you know, we need to put invoices in on time. We need to get this information and they have to not only be in on time, they have to go through an approval process that's new to the agency. So a lot of it is just learning curve. And then as Jennifer mentioned, when you have a transition year, the year that's being audited was half in the old system and half in the new system. That's gonna be something that you wanna look at really closely and make sure that there were no errors made. Um, so that's the other complication in the audit year we're looking at. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. And also, I want to thank you and your team. I, I can't imagine, you know, the workload and what you had to go through. So we appreciate everything you, you do. Yeah. Thank you. It is a great team and they have been working really hard. <laughs> And you probably are aware, but Kimberly's also brand new to the agency. So that's our finance. 
real quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for that. And Kimberly, a moment ago, you mentioned something about, I think it was reconciling accounts receivable. What exactly does that mean? So um, as related to the toll operations, our customers come in and um, they have accounts. And so if they use the road, a lot of times it's, um, of actually a violation, they use the road, we don't have anything on file, we send them a notice that they need to pay us. So the fact that they need to pay us, we create an accounts receivable. So we have to track everybody that owes us money. And um, that detail is in our back office system and we need to make sure that the, the financial, the dollar amounts in our ERP system are matching the backup detail. <laughs> so the, those will be carryovers and assuming they're correctly tracked. There, those will be carryover, um, and we will. It, what, what we work to do is make sure that those dollar amounts in our financial statements are um, supported by detailed report out of our back office system. Fantastic, thank you. And I want to commend Jennifer. I see you sitting here more often than not at uh, our several meetings. So thank you both, David. Yeah, just one quick question, Kimberly. Where, what's the status of the books? Are they closed as of fiscal year 23, 24 at this point? No, we're still reviewing entries and making entries. So we'll have them ready when the auditors come in December. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, I'll just add that I appreciated the presentation again, and I do believe you're spot on with respect to the areas of risk. And uh, I, I think you've done a good job looking into the top areas that certainly concern me. So looking forward to what you find and the report and uh, thanks for coming out and presenting again. Really appreciate it and thanks to staff as well. Uh, and I don't envy you, but it's gonna be a, a complicated six months, but I uh, hope, hope you have a reasonably decent time getting through it and thanks for all the work. So thanks guys. With that, we will move on to the next item, which is item number six. Um, this is the update on the independent performance auditors annual performance review. Uh, I'll start uh, by noting that um, um, Ms. Pinckney Forrest and I reviewed some of the survey questions that were used, I did some updates and uh, I've uh, entered the survey into the system and hopefully today there should be an email coming out sometime today or very soon asking everybody to participate participate in the survey. I set a deadline of November 15th. So all of you should be getting this uh, survey and a request to participate. And uh, so please try to get uh, responses in by November 15th. Uh, outside of that, uh, the other thing that's uh, intended to happen today is this is the opportunity for Courtney to, to brag and just show all of the great things her office has accomplished this year. So we can uh, all uh, uh, mull that over for a bit as we prepare for the, the main discussion and our next meeting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Courtney, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Again, I'm Courtney Ruby. I'm the Independent Performance Auditor, and today's presentation is on OIPA's accomplishments since I took over in November of 2023. So just as background, that Board Policy 39 3.1.11 states that it is the responsibility of the Audit Committee to conduct the Independent Performance Auditor's annual performance evaluation against performance measures established and adopted by the Audit Committee. So today I will walk through a year in review and my focus is purpose, people, and results. So first, my purpose is to create a model independent audit and investigative oversight office, looking into what matters, when it matters, and prioritizing impact, leveraging our limited resources to achieve timely accountability and transparency. People. So first, a successful leadership transition and a team integration. I've been honored to lead the team that I inherited. They have been committed to our purpose and ensuring that we met the, the, all the accomplishments that I share with you today. It has been an integrated and supported team almost from the beginning. So I'm incredibly grateful to my team. We presented to you in February of 2024, a staff reorganization and recruitment analysis, excuse me, an audit staff analysis. And from that came the staff reorganization and recruitment plan that I'll go over. 
I've also defined team performance expectations and established audit and investigation training program. So first, the staff reorganization and recruitment. In February, we presented to you a staffing analysis that demonstrated that OIPA's size should be between 10 and 14 audit professionals, and that based on that, that we should increase our size of two audit professionals each year over the next three years. We also presented a reorganization that included promoting the gentleman to my left, Lloyd Carter, to the Deputy Performance Audit, Independent Performance Auditor position, as well as adding an official position as the Associate Administrative Analyst, which we were so um, fortunate to have Emily Mullen join our team. This demonstrates the organization of OIPA in three general areas, investigations, general auditing, and contract auditing. You'll see on here that we're currently recruiting for two positions, a principal independent auditor, which really is an audit manager in simpler terms, as well as a senior independent auditor. And then we have two vacancies in next year's budget, and we will be presenting the budget to you at the next audit committee meeting. So in May, when Emily joined us, this position was designed to assist with procurements, publications, data visualization, and other analytical and administrative tasks. It has been incredibly successful to have Emily on board, and we've seen an immediate increase in productivity, including we have three procurements in process right now, the finance department independent assessment, which will be released, the RFP will be released next week. We just did the final reviews on it yesterday. We have outside legal services and a third party whistleblower hotline provider. And that's really just for the intake. So you'll see the case management, but it'll have an outward facing page that will make it easier for employees or other stakeholders to access the system and provide that information to us cleanly and independently. And then Emily developed a new report format for the OIPA Audit and Investigation Recommendation and Corrective Action Plan Status Report and worked alongside the team during the verification of the audit recommendations. As well, she's drafted a dashboard that we've been talking about basically since I came on board, really wanting to put that dashboard up so you could easily see the status of recommendations going forward. And then we have procured a new audit timekeeping and recommendation tracking software. And Emily's currently working with the team on that implementation right now. I already talked about our two recruitments in place that were initiated in August of 2024, and that you will see two new positions in our budget request. So in June of every year, performance evaluations are uh, to be completed and presented to our team members throughout the agency. As part of this process, I defined management expectations and staff expectations, and then provided feedback on these expectations, both from a standpoint of these are new expectations that I've put in place, so the team would be clear on what the expectations are, and then giving them feedback in relation to where they are currently and the steps that they would take in order to, if, if any steps were needed to address them, we address that during performance evaluations. We established an audit and investigation training program, and it really is my philosophy that it is my responsibility to ensure every team member has what they need to succeed and to impart my knowledge and passion of government accountability to my team through training, fun, connection, and leadership. When I presented to you the annual work plan under my tenure, which was in July I presented that, you saw in there that I had uh, goals of that the auditors will achieve their professional certification and licensing requirements, including completing no less than 40 annual hours of CPE and increased specialized audit and investigation expertise within OIPA, and that 50% of the audit team will participate in specialized 
training in contracting and investigations. So as we stated earlier, we are on the track right now with our government auditing standards to make sure that the team is steeped in government auditing standards. Five out of the 16 members between August and October have completed 28 hours of CPE. By December, all team members will have had 40 hours of government auditing standards training. Additionally, Doug DePete, who's a whistleblower manager and investigator with myself, went to New York to uh, complete the Certified Inspector General's Investigation Certification course. And then the last, just to point out that as of today, well, uh, as of September, let me see. As of September, we now have three certified fraud examiners who are on staff with OIPA, myself, Doug DePete, and Michael Ryan. And then I informed you previously in July that we joined ALGA, and that is the Association of Local Government Auditors. It is an important professional organization for training, networking, leadership development, and sharing among peers. So as far as results, we issued five annual reports this year. I initially revised the former IPA's annual audit plan based on me coming on board. We presented that in January. In July, we presented the annual investigations report and the risk assessment and the annual audit plan under myself for fiscal year 25. And just this past Let's see, October, we presented to you the audit and investigation recommendation and corrective action plan status report. We really are looking for a new title on that because <laughs> that's a mouthful. And then the external audit recommendation compilation report. We released two audits, the operational process and system control audit of board members and employee travel and other business related reimbursements. This work was performed under the former IPA and released under myself. And then the performance audit of Sandex contracts and invoice payment processing. We launched two audits this year, the Sandex sole source procurement process and Sandex contracting with h and we released three investigations and a detailed response. In March, we released the investigation report on Sandag State Route 125 toll operations. We then released a response to management's response to that investigation. And in October, we released two more investigations, the whistleblower investigation on the new back office system implementation, as well as the companion investigation to the March investigation. That is when ETAN's significant performance issues were known by whom and what actions occurred. Additionally, we have been engaged in outreach to Sandag staff to inform them what OIPA does and how you file a whistleblower complaint. The annual reports are listed here for your information, gives you more detail on each one of them. The audits are listed here in addition to the two audits that we launched, it gives you a little bit more information. We have the investigations listed out with more detailed information on the investigations. And lastly, just to touch on the outreach again, because it is so important. And we talked about this right when I, in January, when I presented the revised annual audit plan to say how important it is to make sure that we're doing employee outreach and that people really understand what the hotline is and the importance of reporting. So in April on the 17th and 18th, I presented to 180 employees on both the investigation that we released as well as um, OIPA and our hotline. And that, in, so we have, it was 180 employees out of approximately 426. So we had outreach to 42% of the employees in April. In August, we presented at the director's executive team me meeting on what OIPA does. And then in, on October 7th, when we released the investigations, we released those directly to the employees of Sandag and also um, noted in that email to them that we would be holding outreach events on November 13th and 14th so they could learn more about the whistleblower hotline program and ask questions about OIPA. And lastly, I did make brief remarks on October 10th at the agency-wide staff meeting regarding the whistleblower program and our uh, upcoming outreach events. 
the meeting the performance measures as outlined in the revised January audit plan for fiscal year 24. The first is continuing professional education that 100% of the professional staff receive the 40 hours annually. The That target was 90%. It, it actual will be 100%. Percentages of planned engagements versus number of engagements conducted. So here the on target was 80%. We come in to, at 75%. However, I wanna just explain that I dropped the timekeeping audit and assisting management with ERP controls due to other priorities and maintaining independence. So we are to assess and analyze management's operation. We are not to assist them in designing controls. Um, so that's why the ERP piece was dropped. And then we had unplanned work come on, um, including the two investigations that we just released last month. The contract and continuous audit, this is another mouthful, so give me a second. <laughs> Contacting continuous auditing operational process and system control review was merged into the performance audit of Zandag's contracts, invoicing and payment process that we, we released on July 3rd, 2024. When we look at budgeted versus actual hours for engagements, we came in under budget 100% of the time. The next goal was defined as the percentage of OIPA's key goals achieved. However, it also included the risk assessment, so we broke this out to make it more clear. The top is the risk assessment participation, and when I did the risk assessment, which was presented in the annual audit plan for fiscal year 25, we had 73% participation. That includes board members, audit committee members, executive staff, as well as senior directors. Um, so those are the 73% participation from the, that combined. When we look at percentage of OIPA's key goals achieved, so we had four goals in the January revised plan and 75% of the goals were achieved. The reason we're at 75% is because the second goal, and I apologize that I did not capture this when we did the revision in January, says to work directly with the Director of Technology on the development of the agency-wide ERP system. This goal would, be, would impair our independence. So that is why it was not done. We have a goal for public transparency and accountability. Uh, we, I really enjoyed presenting to you at the last audit committee meeting, our revised presentation of the corrective action plans and the recommendation follow-up, as well as the external compilation. And there you see that we're 100%. And then last, which is underway right now, as Chair Zito stated, you'll be performing a 360 review evaluation of my self-survey. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions or provide any clarification. Great, thanks. I'll start with checking to see if we have any public comment. Tessa? There are no public comments on this item. Great, any committee member comments, questions about this? David? Um, it seems on the one hand, just yesterday where you started, but yet, many moons ago also. So I really appreciate all the work you've been doing and and uh, thank you. And I'll note that as per practice in previous years, my plan is at the next meeting, we will start with a close, not start the meeting, but start this item with a closed session, discuss anything we feel is appropriate in closed session, and then have a follow on open session item to um, talk about all the things in open session that is appropriate as well on this particular item. Other than that, any other comments, questions, thoughts? I uh, would like to thank you for putting this together. I know it's never easy to, to do all the self-reflection, but it, it is very helpful for the committee and it's great to sh show the public as to all the wonderful work that our group's been doing over the past year. And like David, it's hard to believe it's been a year, probably difficult for you as well. But um, uh, with that, uh, the, uh, the, we are at the end of the agenda. I will note that 
Um, at staff request um, right now, I am contemplating and the plan is to leave our next meeting at 1 p.m. Um, I don't know if anybody updated that already. And yes, that seems a little bit risky given board history, but I've, I've seen the draft agenda and I've, I've put out the, the, the salient warnings uh, saying that if the agenda seems to grow much, um, I will choose to delay it a little bit. So please keep on top of your email and also perhaps leave a little bit of extra time that afternoon in case we do have to push it. But right now, our next meeting is scheduled for Friday, December 6th at 1 p.m. And I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving.